police knew from the beginning they were dealing with a very dangerous situation. But even they were not prepared for what they would find when they stormed the post office this morning. They had expected to see a handful of hostages. Instead, they walked through a building full of bodies. Police found three workers who were shot but survived the ordeal. One hid in a safe until the shooting was over. One of the dead was found in the parking lot, shot in the back as he had tried to escape the massacre. And inside the building, 14 more bodies, most caught unaware of what was going on until it was too late. Cheryl had come equipped with extra clips for his semi-automatic pistols, enough ammunition to make sure a lot of people would die. There were people shot all through that building. Uh, toward the front, toward the back, down both sides, which would indicate that he traveled throughout the entire area. And uh, uh, it looks like he just tried to eliminate everybody that was in the building with him at the time. Cheryl walked in the building through the employee entrance. He first shot his supervisor and then attacked employees trapped in small cubicles. He then moved to a large sorting area where he killed three more people. In the main corridor, two more died before Cheryl turned the gun on himself. They're so helpless. There was nothing they could do except stand there and take it. You know, I, it's, a, uh, it's a crazy man. All day, people drifted to the scene, wanting to know what happened. Survivors of the shooting found each other, all glad to be alive. It'll be a long time before anyone here forgets this tragedy, but already some who survived the massacre are feeling very lucky to be alive. I'll be on my knees thanking my God. I think it just shows a uh, combined effort for all of us to, to show the families of the, the postal employees that we're behind them and with, that we're, we're sorry and we hope we can do anything that they'd like us to do. advice do you have uh, to avoid any kind of a crunch at the polls next Tuesday? Down in uh, Darrell Roberts Senate District, you think illustration uh, in Bryan County, there are five candidates in each of the three uh, uh, county commissioner races for the Democratic nomination. There's a hotly contested uh, state representative race. There's a vigorously contested state Senate race. The election officials in Bryan County expect an all-time record high turnout in the Democratic primary. The people here were from all over central Oklahoma, but mostly this ceremony was for Edmund, a chance for the people here to show how they hurt and know that others feel the same pain. Family members of the victims were seated up front, behind them area postal employees, some of whom survived Wednesday's brutal attack. I would like to thank each of you for coming. Your presence will give them strength in knowing that all of you cared. And on behalf of you who are here to recognize the family, I wish to say to the family that we are here because we love you.
I'm Peter Mays. Candidates are doing some last-minute campaigning, trying to drum up more votes before tomorrow's election. Some candidates took to the streets today to meet voters and pass out campaign materials. Others made whirlwind tours of the state. Most candidates admit they are anxious to see what the voters have to say at the polls tomorrow. All they can do is watch and wait. Yes, I'm just calling to remind you to go vote tomorrow, Tuesday. The polls are open from 7 until 7. Okay. Very much so. We, uh, about three weeks ago, we started doing some tracking polling and uh, it showed a, a very sizable increase in uh, percentage points both in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. And uh, over the last week, we've noticed a real, real change in the uh, attitudes of voters. Uh, you know, we had a high undecided, probably the highest undecided that I've ever seen in a race. And a lot of other people have said that it's just amazing, you know, with 50, 55 percent. Well, apparently they've all decided who they're going to vote for now. And uh, I think that's one reason why we have a high turnout. The fairly new voting system was put to the test again in yesterday's election, and once again, Murphy's Law seemed to haunt the polling places. There were more problems with the voting boxes. Officials say they continue to jam because the boxes are too small to hold a large number of the long ballots. And there were problems with confusion. Voters, not used to the different ballots, were a bit miffed about how to mark the spot for their candidates. And some polled workers were dazed by the new procedure, even though they've been through training. And more confusion back at the election board headquarters led to a small traffic jam. Poll workers dropping off ballot boxes also had to wait to be paid for their services on the spot, unlike previous years where the check came through the mail. Now that was outside the headquarters. Inside, there was yet another problem. Host computer went down about four times, it stayed off about ten times, ten minutes each time. Well, minor problems or not, Hayes says they'll have to be worked out, hopefully, before the September 16th primary runoff date. For the computer errors, larger voting boxes will be brought in. Hopefully, that'll cut down on some of the jamming. And for the human error, well, people will just have to exercise more patience at the polls. Uzi Brown, News 4. have the facts laid out on that basis. Do you feel like you've tried to characterize him as an old governor? They know that to be untrue. The important point here, I think, is that we are going to uh, conduct a campaign uh, that is uh, very straightforward, that is very tough, is very aggressive, but we are not going to engage in personal attacks, and we're not going to engage <clears throat> in attacks on someone's character. Well, fortunately, not everybody's bankrupt. Yeah. There are some businesses. We've saved ratepayers over $400 million, and he runs ads that distort that record and say we gave away $500 million. He knows better, his people knows better, and now they want a code of ethics. The fact is, I've always told the truth. I'll continue to tell the truth. I don't know what they have to worry about. I'm not sure what they're worried about right now. It occurs to me they're worried about something, and they wouldn't be asking for a code of ethics at this late date. about the great 
was it nine percent financing and then I decided that uh, I put aside all the other things I should be doing and go out and crash out for them. That grievance arbitration is binding on both parties. That's what the statute says. So we will have to review this overtime award that was given to us by a federal arbitrator and, and see how much impact it's going to have on these negotiations. Yeah, we're Particularly in the winter time when it's even worse. Maybe if it's something that used to be done in your legislature, they will address. Maybe if it's something that used to be done in your legislature, they will address that. Whoever. Circle to the left, go, bound to do, circle to the left, go. Bound Nearly 1,000 dancers are in town to swing their partner and do si do to the instructions of some of the more popular dance callers in the country. During the day, they're participating in dance seminars, learning new steps and moves. Then at night, they don their finest for an evening of fun. It's a pastime that's spreading worldwide. You estimate that we have a little over 10 million square dancers in the country. We had a, a our national convention in Indianapolis this year with a little over 27,000 uh, attending. The national convention is coming to Oklahoma City in 1989. They're expecting nearly 40,000 people then. And it's regional conventions like this one that help the young and the old learn the intricate maneuvers. Well, it does take a, a set of lessons to learn to do modern type square dancing. And they've taken it out of the barn and put it in the ballrooms, and so it's a more sophisticated type of dancing than it used to be. And it takes a set, a basic set of lessons will take about 20 weeks. And then the, you can go into more difficult dancing also, and it takes longer to learn all that. He called this a weave chasse, so we're going to turn left this time. Turn left in Chasse 3. The Chaparral Convention will wind up its activities at noon tomorrow. Storm Smith, News 4. We have not received any phone calls or any information of anyone missing that fits that description. So until we can get more information or something to uh, show us that it's not an abduction, we're going to carry it as an abduction.
It's been nearly eight months since Ronald Keith Boyd allegedly gunned down a policeman on an Oklahoma City street. Today, jury selection began in Boyd's first-degree murder trial. The Oklahoma City resident is charged with killing 32-year-old Richard Riggs. Police say Riggs stopped a van that Boyd was riding in last January 7th. The officer was investigating an armed robbery that took place just a few minutes earlier. Boyd allegedly shot Riggs twice before fleeing the scene. The policeman died a short while later. Boyd was arrested the next day after a five-hour standoff with police. District Attorney Bob Macy says he will ask for the death penalty if Boyd is convicted. Macy says the trial won't last long. Boyd's attorney isn't so sure. We've paired our witness list to about 22, and like I say, we feel very comfortable in getting to the jury this week. This will be a difficult trial just because of the nature of the charge, and it particularly so where a police officer is involved. Jury selection is expected to wrap up tomorrow. Testimony in the case could be completed as early as Friday. Peter Mays, News 4. The wheels are already turning to get things ready for opening day of the Oklahoma State Fair. Workers spent the day piecing together the monorail that will circle the fairgrounds when the fair opens in two weeks. Officials there have added an extra day to this year's festivities with a kickoff September 18th featuring Willie Nelson. Donna Gregory, News 4 Nightcast. Just a loud explosion from inside. They are rushing the building at this time. All of that is purely up to speculation at this time. Robbery, uh, I can't say that it's been totally ruled out, but from the information that we have at this point, robbery does not appear to be a motive. See, in, in that the uh, cash receipts inside the store were not disturbed by the two gunmen.
had them certified. <laughs> Cocaine, the most widely used drug in the country, next to marijuana. Users attest to its euphoric effect, making anything in the world seem possible, except quitting. And now crack, a new fast food and dangerous type of cocaine, processed and packaged, has created what drug experts are calling an epidemic of abuse. The high achieved from smoking it is enough to make a first-time user an addict within a year. That epidemic has swept through Oklahoma. The Oklahoma City Police Department's forensic laboratory tests all of the drugs confiscated in police arrests. Its caseload of cocaine has more than doubled in the last year. The intensity of the cocaine, the concentration of the cocaine is dramatically has increased also. And it's gone from about a 15 to 40 percent range of cocaine to a percentage range of 40 to 80 percent. It got to the point where I just couldn't look at myself in the mirror. Uh, I was using um, all my money to um, do the drug. I, I was thinking about it constantly. You know, I was obsessed with the idea, you know, and uh, one night I just, it was either suicide or it was getting help. This young woman used cocaine for seven years before finally seeking treatment, intensive treatment in a drug rehabilitation program. But only after she incurred huge debts and resorted to stealing to support her addiction. She says the only way to quit is to admit you have a problem. I think just a simple phone call, whether it be to a family member, a treatment center, or some type of agency, a friend, just admitting that you think you have a problem or that you don't like the way you're living, you know, just that's the first step of, you know, getting into recovery. If you need help, call the cocaine hotline, 1-800-COCAINE. Terry Cook News 4, Nightcast. They can be matched by Oklahoma City. We starved of funds for a while. The idea is about how they want to do things, and thus the, uh, that will starve this county over a million. Higher taxes, higher school insurance for our buses, higher electric bills. It just, just totally, and the people out here just cannot afford any more. And uh, we've already are one of the highest paying tax people as there is. So there's no advantages. We have very few leads in this particular case and would like to make an appeal to the public, especially those persons that live in that neighborhood, that if anyone saw any suspicious behavior, any uh, people that did not fit in the neighborhood, to please contact the uh, homicide unit of the Oklahoma City Police Department.
If there was such a place as downtown Deer Creek, this would be it. There are only a handful of retail stores, no industrial development, and a limited tax base. Technically, this bedroom community, comprised mostly of large acreage developments, is part of Edmond, but with the distinction of having its own school system. In an effort to secure enough land to build a water line north to Guthrie, Oklahoma City quickly annexed just over 58 square miles of Deer Creek last month. Today, with similar haste, the city council voted to give just over half of that land back. really don't see how it could benefit the citizens of Deer Creek being under, uh, being within the, the city limits of Oklahoma City. Uh, sir. But for the gallery full of Deer Creek residents at today's meeting, 28 square miles of their community in the hands of Oklahoma City is still too much. We acknowledge that you have a, a problem with your pipeline and, and we do anything to help, but we just don't want to be uh, citizens of Oklahoma City because we have a quality of life that, uh, that we think is unequaled anywhere. Deer Creek residents are also concerned the annexation will have an adverse effect on their school system. The state already cut this district's budget by 19 percent. They fear the added taxation will hinder efforts to raise money for schools. Also, Oklahoma City's move north reclassifies many Deer Creek roads from rural to urban. That could change insurance rates for the school's buses. If uh, our insurance costs double on our buses, well, then we've got to go into the budget and rob Peter to pay Paul, basically, take some money away to get the insurance paid for, because we have to have the insurance for the buses to run. Well, you know what to do with him, man. Bill Graves is counting on organizational skills to put him in the Attorney General's office. With more than 700 volunteers statewide, this eight-year veteran of the legislature believes his door-to-door -door approach can be successful. Graves has directed his limited budget on mailers and a small amount of radio advertising. He has spent significantly less than his opponent. Yet, according to the candidate, money isn't the key to this race. Issues are. And he claims his positions are clear. I authored a bill last year in the legislature to toughen up the death penalty law and to speed up death penalty appeals. And of course, that's one, one of my high priorities as a candidate for attorney general is to speed up death penalty appeals uh, on election. I'm Brian Griffin. I'm running for attorney general of Oklahoma. Brian Griffin is also out hitting the streets. He spent much of the day out with the people in Ponca City. But unlike Graves, this candidate has waged a media war. With almost a quarter of a million dollars in his war chest, Griffin is spending money on radio and TV advertising. Griffin is also a proponent of the death penalty. But if elected, he has a different priority than his opponent. The attorney general is empowered to be the guardian of the public trust, to be the watchdog of state government. Now, I think that function has been largely ignored in recent years, and it's time we bring back to the office of attorney general an attorney general who will make ethics in government a top priority. The Griffin Graves contest has seemed to rise above some of the name calling that has plagued other races. However, the Graves literature does make mention that Griffin at one time was a Democrat. On the other side, Griffin contends he is not a professional politician like his opponent, who spent eight years in the legislature. The first primary went to Griffin, but only by a slim margin. In Ponca City, Kurt Autry, News 4. Of course, we are now building about 90% Chevrolets from about a 50-50 mix we had before with Buicks and Chevrolets, and that requires less manpower. We had to reduce a number of our skilled trades training programs back there in July because we lost the W car, the GM10, and that ripple effect now has affected the uh, workforce.
principle. <laughs> From the state of Oregon, Bolton Middle School, Dr. Michael Tannenbaum, principal. On the front lines in the battle to accomplish the things I've country, especially your peers. Try and make learning fun for them, and everybody working together on the same vision, the same mission. We have a philosophy that we go by, and we really try and make um, Dennis Elementary a positive learning environment. National recognition means a great deal. Uh, the students were just as excited about this day as we were coming, and we plan on having more ceremony for them and celebration for them when we get back. Tools are the heart and soul of the process by which we raise successful, responsible citizens. Nobody else can really replace you. Germany are. And uh, it all begins in, with what you're doing and now doing so well.